ever try putting a price tag on like a self-driving car before they actually existed. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what we're dealing with in the crypto world. Yeah. You're curious about how anyone can actually value these things, right? right? Not just the what's it worth today, but the whole H O W. Yeah. Well, buckle up. We're diving deep into crypto asset valuation. Okay. With a recent CFA Institute guide as our map. And let me tell you, this guide does not shy away from the tough questions. Well, it's like stepping into a room okay. full of financial experts. Yeah each with their own take on this wild new asset class. Which is exactly what makes this so juicy. I mean, I get the basics of valuing like a regular company. Right. But crypto just throws those rule books out the window. Yeah. It's like comparing apples to laser beams. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they both exist. Yeah. But good luck finding a common measuring stick. It's true. Those trusty old valuation models built for stocks and bonds. Yeah. They don't quite fit the mold when you're dealing with right. decentralized networks and digital scarcity. Okay, so we need new tools, new thinking. Yeah. But where do we even begin? This CFA guide seems to be the uh, talk of the town. It is, yeah. and for good reason. It starts by acknowledging the elephant in the room. Okay. Crypto is not a monolith. Okay. You can't value Bitcoin the same way you value Ethereum. Right. And you certainly can't value a decentralized exchange the same way you value either of those. Right, it's like saying, I understand all art because I've seen a Monet. Exactly. Not quite how it works. Nope. So how does this guide break down the crypto landscape? It dives into three main categories. Smart contract platforms. Okay. Decentralized applications. And, and then there's Bitcoin. Right. Standing in its own category as always. Okay. So smart contract platforms first. Right. I've heard that term thrown around a lot. <laughs> Think, uh, uh, Ethereum, yeah. Solana. Yeah, yeah. But for those of us who aren't fluent in, you know, blockchain. Yeah, right. What exactly are we talking about here? Imagine the foundation of a house. Okay. That's what smart contract platforms are. They provide the infrastructure. Okay. The rules. Yeah. The programming language. Right. For building all sorts of decentralized applications. Yeah. Ethereum is a great example. Well, it's like the bedrock yeah. upon which a whole ecosystem of financial tools, yeah. games, yeah. and digital marketplaces are being built. So Ethereum is like the digital landscape, and yeah. then all these decentralized apps are like, what, the building's going up on that land? Precisely. Yeah. And just like the value of land can skyrocket wow. as more and more impressive structures are built on it, yeah. the value of these platforms can fluctuate okay. based on the utility and adoption of the applications they support. Makes sense. So how do we even begin to wrap our heads around valuing these foundational platforms. Yeah. Is there a like a go-to approach? Well. Or are we still in uncharted territory? Right? So we're staring down these smart contract platforms, mm -hmm. the foundations of this whole crypto ecosystem. Right. But how do you even begin to put a price tag on something right. that's essentially digital infrastructure? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Right. The CFA guide lays out two main perspectives here. Okay. You can analyze these platforms like traditional businesses okay. with cash flows, yeah. or you can view them as networks right. driven by user growth and activity. Okay. Both angles offer valuable insights. Okay. So two sides of the same coin. Right. Let's start with that first view, okay. treating these platforms like businesses. Yeah. What are we looking at in terms of revenue streams? Yeah. It's not like they're selling tangible products, right? Exactly. Yeah. This is where transaction fees come into play. Okay. Every action taken on a smart contract platform, right. whether it's executing a trade on a decentralized exchange right. or simply sending tokens between wallets, yeah. requires a small fee. These fees are typically paid in the platform's native token, right. like Ether for Ethereum. So kind of like a toll road, but for digital transactions. Exactly. Uh -huh. More traffic equals more revenue for the platform. Right, right. And here's where it gets interesting. Okay. The CFA guide delves into the mechanics of these transaction fees, okay. particularly on Ethereum. Yeah. It's not as simple as a flat fee for each action. Right. Instead, there's this whole system involving okay. gas, yeah. GUE, yeah. a base fee, and a priority fee. Okay, now you're just using fancy words to make me feel like I should have paid more attention in my computer science classes. All right. 
Break it down for me. What's with all the jargon? No worries. It's actually pretty intuitive once you wrap your head around it. Okay. Think of gas as the fuel okay. that powers these transactions on the Ethereum network. Okay. Each computational step a transaction requires yeah. right. consumes a certain amount of gas. Okay. The price of gas measured in way. Right. A tiny fraction of ether okay. fluctuates based on network demand. Right. The higher the demand, yeah. the more expensive it becomes to execute transactions. Correct. Just like surge pricing on a ride sharing app. Okay, so that's gas and way. Right. Supply and demand in action. Exactly. But what about the base fee and priority fee? Right. So the base fee is the minimum price you have to pay okay. to get your transaction included in the next block yeah. on the Ethereum blockchain. Right. It's designed to stabilize transaction costs right. and prevent network congestion. Okay. Think of it like the standard fare for your ride. Makes sense. And the priority fee. Yeah. Is that like tipping your driver to get there faster? You got it. Okay. Miners who are responsible for adding blocks of transactions to the blockchain okay. prioritize transactions with higher priority fees. Right. So if you're in a hurry to execute a trade right. or transfer tokens, yeah. you can bump up your priority fee to jump the queue. So all these microtransactions with their fluctuating fees, right. bidding wars, yeah. they all add up to revenue for the platform. Exactly. Yeah. That's pretty wild. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. And it's all happening behind the scenes, completely automated. And this is all happening behind the scenes, completely automated. Yeah, it's really incredible. That's wild. And the CFA guide, actually explores applying traditional valuation models yeah. like the discounted cash flow dcf yeah. model right to these fee structures yeah it's fascinating to see how they're trying to bridge the gap yeah between traditional finance and this new world of decentralized networks okay the dcf my finance professor is probably doing a victory dance somewhere right hearing that mentioned in the same breath as crypto. Exactly. But isn't the DCF notorious for being sensitive to assumptions? Yes. About future growth and discount rates? It is. Doesn't that make it even trickier to apply to crypto? It does. Which is already so unpredictable. You're absolutely right. Okay. That's a major caveat the guide emphasizes. Predicting future cash flows for these platforms right. is like trying to predict the weather months in advance. Yeah. A lot can change. Right. Even slight variations in assumed growth rates yeah. or discount rates yeah. can lead to wildly different valuations. Okay, so while it's tempting to slap a DCF model onto these platforms and call it a day, right. we have to tread carefully. Yeah. Okay, so that's one perspective. Right. Viewing smart contract platforms through a business lens. Right. But you mentioned there's a whole other way to think of out this yes the network perspective yes what's that all about okay yeah. so we've talked about transaction fees right and the challenges of predicting future cash flows yeah but you mentioned this whole other perspective on valuing smart contract platforms yeah the network view right i'm intrigued what's the thinking there instead of focusing on traditional financial metrics okay the network perspective zooms in on a platform's user base right and their activity okay imagine it like this Okay. The more people use and build on a platform like Ethereum, right. the more valuable it becomes. It's right. the same principle that drives the success of social media giants. Right. More users attract even more users. Yeah. Creating a powerful network effect. Right, like a snowball effect. Yeah. As more people use a platform. Exactly. It becomes more useful and attractive to others and so on. Yeah. Makes sense. But how do we actually measure this network effect in a tangible way? The CFA guide highlights some key yeah. on-chain metrics yeah. that provide valuable clues. Okay. One of the most talked about uh -huh. is total value locked, or TVL. Okay. It's essentially a measure of how much cryptocurrency is locked up right. in a platform's ecosystem. Right. Think of it as the total deposits okay. held by a bank, right. Ethereum, right. with its massive DeFi ecosystem, right. currently boasts the highest TVL. Okay. But we're seeing newer platforms starting to gain traction. So a high TVL suggests that users are putting their money where their mouth is, right. betting on the platform's future success. Precisely. Okay. It's a powerful signal of user confidence and engagement. Okay. And then there's developer activity. Yeah. The number of developers building applications on a platform. Right. A vibrant developer community is like a sign of yeah. a healthy ecosystem. Right. Constantly innovating and attracting even more users. So we're looking for platforms with a large and active user base. Yeah a high TVL, 
and a bustling developer community. Right. It's like evaluating the potential of a city. Right. You want to see bustling streets, thriving businesses. Exactly. And a constant flow of new residents. That's a great analogy. Yeah. And just like a city's success isn't solely determined by its size or mm -hmm. population, right. the CFA guide cautions against relying solely on TVL okay. or developer count. Right. It's important to consider the specific applications and use cases right. driving that growth. Right. Are they sustainable? Right. Do they solve real world problems? Right. These are all crucial questions to ask. So no single metric tells the whole story. Right. It's about piecing together the puzzle. Exactly. Now, before we get too lost in the weeds of smart contract platforms, right. we can't forget about all the cool stuff being built on top. Yeah. Those decentralized applications or dApps. Right. We touched on decentralized exchanges well, earlier, yeah, yeah. those peer to peer trading platforms. Right. But the DeFi world goes way beyond just trading, right? Absolutely. Yeah. DeFi is like a parallel financial universe okay. offering everything from lending and borrowing uh, to insurance and asset management, yeah. all without the need for traditional intermediaries. It's like taking the entire financial system right. and rebuilding it from the ground up using blockchain technology. Exactly. Mind-blowing. It's incredible. The yeah. pace of innovation in this space is just mind-blowing. So we've got these decentralized exchanges like Uniswap, Curve, and Balancer. Yeah. What other types of DeFi platforms are out there? Yeah. And how do their valuations differ? Decentralized lending platforms like um and Compound are a great example. Okay. They allow users to lend and borrow crypto right. directly from each other, okay. setting interest rates through algorithms okay. rather than relying on banks. So it's like cutting out the middleman and letting the code decide. Essentially. I'm trying to wrap my head around how you'd even begin to value something like that. It's a fascinating challenge. Right. Traditional valuation models don't quite translate right. as these platforms often generate revenue through a combination of okay. interest rate spreads, right. fees on borrowed assets, okay. and the issuance of governance tokens that give holders a say in the platform's future. Governance tokens. Yes. So like having a vote in how the platform evolves. Exactly. That adds a whole other layer of complexity to the valuation puzzle. It does. It's incredible how much innovation is happening in this space. It really is an exciting time to be following this space. It is. And it's moving at breakneck speed. It is. But amidst all this innovation, yeah. we can't forget about the OG crypto asset that started it all. Right. Bitcoin. Bitcoin, the one and only. Even though it's been around for over a decade. Yeah. Valuing Bitcoin remains one of the biggest debates. That's true. In the crypto world. Yeah. It's fascinating, isn't it? Right. It's like trying to value a Picasso painting. Right. Everyone agrees it's valuable. Yes. But good luck getting two people to agree on the exact price. Exactly. So where does the CFA guide land on this whole Bitcoin valuation conundrum? It dives headfirst into the debate. Okay. Exploring a wide range of valuation models. Okay. Each with its own strengths and limitations. Right. You've got your stock to flow models. Right. That emphasize Bitcoin scarcity okay. and controlled supply. Okay. Your total addressable market approaches. Right. That try to estimate Bitcoin's potential. If it were to replace a portion of gold right. or global money supply, right. and even models based on Metcalf's law, okay. relating Bitcoin's value to its growing network of users. It's so like everyone's got their own pet theory, right. their own crystal ball trying to predict Bitcoin's future. Exactly. But from what I'm hearing, yeah. there's no single model that everyone agrees on. Yep. No magic formula to crack the code. And that's what makes this such a fascinating, right. albeit challenging, right. space to navigate. For sure. What the CFA guide does brilliantly is yeah. it provides a framework for thinking about these valuation challenges, right. prompting us to look beyond simplistic metrics okay. and grapple with the fundamental questions driving this industry's evolution. So where does this leave us? That's the question, isn't it? We've explored smart contract platforms. Yeah dipped our toes into the vast ocean of decentralized applications right. and even acknowledge the enigma that is Bitcoin. Exactly. What's the key takeaway or well, nugget of wisdom we can walk away with from this deep dive? Valuing crypto assets isn't about finding the right answer. Right. Because frankly, there isn't one. Yeah. At least not yet. Right. It's about understanding the underlying technology. 
though. The potential use cases right. and the evolving dynamics of these markets. So it's about asking the right questions. Yes. Even if the answers remain elusive. I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah. It's a journey of exploration and discovery. We've got to embrace the uncertainty, the constant evolution. I agree. And with... approach it all with a healthy dose of curiosity. Absolutely. I'm curious, for our listeners who are ready to dive even deeper, yeah. what would you say is the most important question to keep asking themselves hmm. as they explore this world of crypto asset valuation? That's a great question. Yeah. I'd say the most important question to ask is this. Okay. What problem is this crypto asset solving? Okay. And how effectively is it doing so? Okay. If you can answer that, you're well on your way to developing a more informed perspective right. on its potential value. Love it. So focus on the problem, the solution. Exactly. And always keep asking questions. Absolutely. That's the beauty of this space. It really is. It's constantly evolving, challenging us to think differently. It is. And stay curious. Couldn't agree more. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. Until next time, keep exploring. Yeah. Keep learning. Yes. And who knows? Yeah. Maybe you'll be the one to crack the code of crypto asset valuation.